Are you ready for the biggest, basis and most heavily armed B-17? Well, ready or not, here she comes. Germany, look away. This is Sentimental Journey, B-17G, operated by the commemorative Air Force, Air Base Arizona, and they're also offering living history flight experiences. So if you want to ride on a B-17 in an unforgettable experience, do check them out in the description below. Big thank you here, of course, to them for giving us access and big thank you to all of you, the community, because inside the cockpit is 100% community funded via patrons and crowdfunders. And specific shout out here also to Nathan J for sponsoring this episode. Now, let's step towards the B-17 and check her out in detail. Up front, of course, we have the nose, the bombardier position there. And that's, of course, where he would be looking down his bomb site in order to uh, uh, bomb a factory target or whatever it had to be blown up on the ground during World War II. Now, not all bombardiers would carry the Norton bomb site because, the, of course, the US went to a formation bombing uh, a tactic where only the lead bombardier in the lead bomber was taking aim and then every other bomber in the formation would drop on his signal as he's releasing his bombs in order then to saturate the target. For self-defense of the bomber, we do have two 50 cals that are mounted offset on either side of the nose in these sort of blisters. And we have a dedicated turret here as well that came out with the B-17G, which also has two 50 cals and that is uh, power operated. So it provides the bombardier with a lot of firepower at his disposal and also gives him a relatively good, good arc to the front of the aircraft to defend against incoming German fighters. Stepping back, back then a little bit, we do have an armored bulkhead behind the bombardier's position and above the bombardier's position, just offset slightly, you find the cockpit and there is another bulkhead there as well. And of course, you also find oxygen bottles in these positions as well for the pilots and for the crew itself to, uh, to breathe at, uh, as they're operating at high altitude. Stepping further towards then the wing, we do have sort of a low mid-wing design in the B-17. And uh, what we have here is the carburetor air intake and the intercooler air intake directly there. Then we come to the engine. Now this is engine number three. They're sequentially numbered starting on the port side of the aircraft, one, two, jumping over the center line and then continuing three, four here on the starboard side. What we have here is an R1820-97. And this is a nine cylinder air cooled radial engine. So you don't need any liquid cooling here. The cooling air goes straight onto the cylinders, cools them there, and is then, is then uh, ejected via the outlet flaps running around the engine cowling. Uh, this engine also has a turbo supercharger and it produces a maximum output of 1,200 horsepower. Now that doesn't sound like much, but remember you have four of these engines and they're quite reliable. In order to achieve 1,200 horsepower, you do need to crank her up to 2,500 RPM and 47 inches of manifold pressure. But if you're sitting at cruise, depending on what sort of cruise level you want to be flying at, you're closer to uh, 2,100 RPM and 36 inches of manifold pressure. And if you're wondering why there is engine noises, we are filming that as this at SeaTac in Seattle at the airport. So every now and then you will hear an engine noise as an airplane comes in or takes off. Now in front of the engine we have the propeller of course. This is a Hamilton standard three bladed propeller. It operates at a low pitch of 20 degrees and it goes all the way up to 80 degrees in order to feather the propeller in case one of these engines is shot from under the crew. If that happens, however, if the engine does get damaged, actually no, not if the engine gets damaged, but if the control link between the cockpit and the engine gets damaged and that link is severed, then these engines do have an automatic throttle -like regulator. And this is really cool because it means that the engine will automatically go to full throttle, supercharger to 65%, intercooler to cold, and RPMs are set at uh, 1850 which is really nice. It gives a little bit of a redundancy to the uh, situation here as well. Now below the engine, we have uh, the uh, supercharger. Then as we come inside, let's have a closer look here at the turbo supercharger as well. And I just want to point out that out of three currently flying B-17, as we tape this episode, Sentimental Journey is only one of two that still uses these original turbo superchargers as well. 
and then to the left of the engine if you just follow me here that honeycombed web inlet there that is for the oil cooling system the oil cooling system in itself there is a bulkhead of course behind the engine protecting it but there's also an oil tank with 37 gallons there each engine also drives a generator and electrical for electrical power of the aircraft and you also find two batteries in the starboard wing and one battery in the port wing for your electrical power the gear here is situated in the inboard nacelle and it retracts inwards semi-retractable by the way you will always see a small part of the of the gear still well that was a noisy bugger well the, these this gear is semi-retractable it always you will always see part of the gear still X on the outside of the nacelle as the B-17 flies. Now we do have the tuber supercharger just behind me there, as you can see. And uh, as we step back here, let me talk a little bit more about the fuel tank. So I'm just going to return to the inboard section of the wing because this is really cool. So we have two fuel tanks that are situated inboard. The first one up here, 213 gallons. And then there's a feeder tank behind it, 212 gallons. And that gives you, quick math, 425 gallons. However, this supply is only for engine number three, or if we look at the port wing, engine number two, or primarily for those uh, engines. We do then have a center fuel tank between the two engines with another 425 gallons. And you've guessed it, that's the one that supplies the outboard engine, so engine number four or engine number one. But that's not all the fuel you have in the aircraft if she's set up in a long range or a long distance configuration. We have so much more fuel because outboard towards the wingtips you will find nine additional cells and these cells sometimes also referred to as tokyo cells even though b-17s never had the range um, provide another 270 gallons now you may not say wait uh, hold on there's nine fuel cells over there but there's two engines per side so that gives an uneven divide yes that's true but because it's chair the size of these cells changes as they go towards the wingtip but they get smaller you have an uneven division of four and five cells that are linked primarily to one of these engines and that's how you get more or less an even split a landing light right behind me and now let's walk towards uh, the aileron you will see that this aileron does not have a trim tab on it but it's quite a large aileron it moves just about here and then of course we have the flaps right here moving all the way towards the the uh, the fuselage on top of the fuselage that's also where you would generally find your life raft in case of emergency and now briefly let's talk about the construction of the aircraft it is an american aircraft so it's going to be semi monocoque and empty weight 36,000 pounds empty tactical weight means that she has some fuel she has a crew on she has some ammunition on but no bombs that would be 41,000 pounds and she can go up to 65,000 pounds fully loaded now let's move towards the tail you can of course see the retractable tail wheel right there and then we have also the icing boots on the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer the same of course you may have already noticed with the wings then we have the elevators right here they are canvas covered here and we have a variable trim tab just towards the tail and of course a massive a massive um, tail in itself with a strong uh, big rudder canvas cover there and a variable trim tab as you can see there now we come to the final piece of the puzzle for the obvious changes that we've seen with the b17g now with the b17g one of the main uh, differences you've already seen is of course that frontal turret that was mounted underneath the bombardier's position as sort of a chin turret now here we have a new addition as well that comes with the g model now you may say hang on b70s always had a tail gunner well yes except for the very first uh, models but this is a different turret this is the cheyenne tail configuration and there has been considerable changes here so initially when the b17s were constructed in their plans as there was the transition to the g model this tail was still the old F model tail. But then these aircraft were flown to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where they were retro refitted with this tail in the new configuration. And that's why it's known as the Cheyenne tail. What this offers is the guns are moved further together and the azimuth deflection of the guns has changed 
considerably. So initially the gunners were restricted to about 30 degrees on either side and very limited elevation and uh, depression as well. But now they can swivel their guns almost to 80 degrees to either side and have much better elevation and depression as well, providing a lot better arcs of fire against German fighters that want to exploit those initial weak spots of the B-17. Moving then further towards the uh, port side of the aircraft, now I have to start talking about all that firepower that this B-17 of course has. Now you've maybe already done the math. Up front we have two machine guns in those blisters, we have two more machine guns in that chin turret, we just passed another two machine guns over there, we're up to, what are we, up to six? Well we have two waist gunner positions as well and these have dedicated gunners. So it's not like the B-25 for example where there's one gunner who's actually the radio operator jumping from each waist gun to the other as he's trying to defend the aircraft. No, no, there's dedicated gunners right here and uh, they have a flex mounted 50 cal each. So now we're up to eight 50 cals. Uh, what I should also add is that all these gunner positions or the majority of these gunner positions were also protected with some armor. And although it's not visible in the current configuration as it is right here, uh, the waist gunners, the guns could actually retract inwards and you could close a door uh, to protect uh, the crude compartment during the moments when you actually don't need to have the gun out. Additionally, beyond that, of course, we have the Sperry turret uh, down there. They're just working on that to actually remove one of the plates so we can have a closer look. And that, of course, is the famous Barry ball turret. It's underneath the aircraft. And the gunner there is essentially sitting in the void because he's not in an upright position. He's actually sitting in that ball turret. You have to be very small. I don't think I would ever even fit in there. And his legs are essentially parallel with the guns as, as he's moving the, uh, the, uh, the ball turret. And what I've also recently found out, which I found really interesting, is that you can actually drop that ball turret in the case of emergency, all you need is two men, a wrench and a hammer and 20 minutes. And you can release that ball turret and that makes it a lot easier if you have to do a belly up landing. Beyond the waste guns and the Sperry ball turret, there are two more defensive fire positions. The first one is of course the obvious one, the turret on top of the aircraft, the upper turret, providing a further two 50 cals. And then the radio operator could operate a deployable flex gun, a flex 50 once again, uh, just on that hump that you see there right behind me. So let's do the math there quickly. Four up front, two in the back, six. Another here, two here, so that's eight. That's 10, that's 12, that's 13. 13 guns on the B-17. I did tell you this was the most heavily armed B-17 there is. With the exception of that experimental chin turret that didn't really see operational service, but you know what I mean. Anyway, let's continue towards then the, uh, the port wing. Now notice here, of course here on the left aileron, we do have a variable trim tab right there with a fixed trim tab attached to it as well. And now let's take a little bit of a detour towards the front of the aircraft in order to talk a little bit more about the ordnance that this bomber could carry. Now this was a heavy bomber in uh, World War II standards and Generally speaking, although she could load a lot of bombs, generally speaking, you can say that about 4,000 pounds were carried on long range mission and about 8,000 pounds were carried on short range missions. And just in case you needed the extra range, for example, for ferry missions, there is the option to install two additional fuel tanks in the bomb base. Those are droppable and they provide each 410 gallons. And in fact, if you wanna go completely overload with this aircraft, when it comes to fuel, well, you have up to you have a capacity of up to 2,800 gallons. So, if you need fuel, a B-17 might be the tool you need. Inside the bomb bay, you can load 22 100-pound bombs, or you could load 16 300-pound bombs, or you could load 12 500-pound bombs, or you could load any sort of other configuration with those bombs, depending on where you place them inside the bomb bay, because it's almost like a W-shaped bomb bay with the, uh, the way that the bombs are positioned. And you could also mount internally 1,000 pound bombs, 1,600 pound bombs, or 2,000 pound bombs with additional smaller bombs mixed in between as well, depending on how your configuration is. Now, 2,000 pound bombs sound pretty big, and they are big. I mean, that's like a 1,000 kilogram bomb for those people that prefer the non-imperial system. But you could mount additional bombs on the outside of the B-17, which some don't see that often talked about. And specifically, in the inboard section of the wing, 
between engine number two and the fuselage and engine number three and the fuselage, there would be a mounting point there as well for even our 1,000 pound bomb, a 1,600 pound bomb, a 2,000 pound bomb, or in fact, a 4,000 pound bomb. And that is really a lot of ordnance. Now, I hope you enjoyed this outside tour of the B-17 and you know what's going to happen now with inside the cockpit, right? Yep, we're going to be jumping inside in the nose and then we're going to go through some of those positions there and then eventually we're going to end up towards the tail as well, going through all the positions. So, here we go. All right, so then coming inside the B-17, as you can see, it is somewhat constricting. Let's head up towards the nose where we would find the bombardier position and the navigator. Uh. Oh, oh, it's actually quite roomy in here. That's nice. Well, welcome to the nose of the B-17. This is where you would, of course, find your bomb site, the chin turret, as well as the navigation on table. In fact, there is a mission sketch in just now. So let's have a look where we're heading. Schweinfurt. Oh, dear. Well, in any case, this is, of course, where a lot of the work that goes into getting the bomber to the target and also then the bombs on the target would take place. So let's have a closer look. Let's start this tour on the nose working our way backwards. I'll provide an overview of each station as we go along and then I'll dive into the details. Airbase Arizona have kept this aircraft in a remarkable condition and much of it is as it would have been during World War II. There are of course obvious exceptions for any requirements for flying under today's regulations and also minimizing the amount of equipment that is carried in some stations just to provide more space for use. Let's dive into the bombardier position then. We have the airspeed indicator in knots and the altimeter in feet to the immediate left for the bombardier's reference during a bombing run. And next to that you will find the weapon system console for setting the specifics of the bomb release patterns. Then, just ahead of a seat that is set above the chin turret, we find the northern bomb site. And control over the twin fitty turret is provided via this two handed control yoke that folds to the right when stowed. A site to use the turret with would usually be installed above the seat. Behind the control yoke, you will see the oxygen regulator as well as a oxygen flow and capacity indicator. As additional guns, two more Chin 50 cal machine guns are installed, one on each side that could be operated by the navigator or even another crew member. Talking about the navigator, let's jump right into his station. You already saw the Astrodome, so now let's talk about what's around this table. On the left, we have the oxygen regulator, then the interphone jackbox, you'll see a lot of those littered around the aircraft, and then the radio compass control box. Moving further to the right, above the table we have a gyro master compass and a gyro magnetic compass, and we also have the gyros compass control switch. The table itself would be accommodating the charts and the tools required for navigation. So on the opposite, so on the right hand side of the aircraft, you will also have the drift recorder. As we go through the tunnel towards the cockpit, notice the yellow oxygen tanks behind the stairs and their respective indicators. Right, the tunnel towards the cockpit then I, is a little bit tiny, but once you're up here, you can actually stand like a normal person. And then you're in the cockpit with the cockpit, with the pilot seat right here and the co-pilot right there. And the camera right now in its position would be where the defensive upper gun turret would be. Okay, so here's the cockpit. I hope you are ready for this. It's about to get wild. On the far left of the pilot, we have a storage bag and a plug-in interphone jack box, the vacuum pump valve selector, as well as the electric power console with respective indicators for the generators and batteries. Moving to the central instrument board, behind the control yoke, we have a voltmeter, a clock, as well as the pilot's oxygen flow and capacity indicators. And then still behind the yoke, but from a slightly different perspective now, the hydraulic pressure indicator, a modern gyroscopic attitude indicator, a modern Garmin navigation system, the de-icing pressure indicator, the fuel suction gauge, and then the co-pilot's oxygen flow and capacity indicators. As we move to the central position here, we approach the majority of the dials that you would expect to see through your basic six. 
First we see of course a modern course deviation indicator. Then we have the attitude indicator, an altimeter in feet, a speedometer in knots, the turn and slip indicator, as well as a vertical speed indicator in feet per minute. Above all this we have the compass as well as the landing gear switch. Now we are approaching the co-pilot side and a lot of engine management gauges are found here. In the B-17 the co-pilot mainly fulfilled the role that the flight engineer fulfilled on British bombers, namely managing the engines. Of course he was also trained to fly and assist the pilot in flying the aircraft. On top we have the manifold pressure indicators for the left and right engines both featuring two needles and colored safety margins. The engine RPM indicators are designed similarly and sit just below. And then we have the flap position indicator. Straight behind the co-pilot's control yoke, the fuel pressure indicators, oil pressure indicators, oil temperature indicators, cylinder head temperature indicators, airstream temperature indicator, we also have the fuel capacity indicator right here, and finally the carburetor filter switches. Moving on towards the right hand side, first off the carburetor air temperature indicator that was previously hidden out of view, and then the primer and starter switches, as well as the emergency fire extinguisher release that could flood an engine with CO2, thus hopefully starving a fire as it develops and as the fuel flow is then cut off by the crew. I actually have a video about what to do when a plane like the B-17 is on fire, so check it out here. Below this we have the intercooler control for the turbo supercharger and then we have the backup hydraulic hand pump. To the far right the previously shown interphone jack box make a, makes a reappearance, a storage basket and then the lighting switch. Right, let's loop back to the center and check out the console here. It is installed between the two crew positions in the cockpit. We have the feather push buttons for the propellers and then we have the ignition switches the switches for the fuel booster pumps, lighting and radio switches, the bomb bay door switch, and in fact the team of Airbase Arizona operated them for us, so here you go. Nestled beside this is the landing light switch and the protected flap control switch. Further down, the cowl flap switches for the cooling of the engine. Again, here is a demonstration by Airbase Arizona. Cowl flaps. One. Two. Three. Four. Traveling rearwards, we have the manifold pressure selector, the mixture control lock, as well as the mixture control levers. And then we come to the throttle. Notice how the handles let you operate one, two or even four engines at the same time. However, it is also possible that the pilot and the co-pilot operate engine one and two, as well as three and four, each at the same time or independently. Below the throttles, you will find the propeller pitch controls. And then beside the console, we have the elevator trim wheel, as well as the throttle control lock. An autopilot control unit is installed at the low end of this central console. And right under it, we find the rudder trim wheel, and the pulled wet handle is the rudder and elevator lock, while the right handle is the tail wheel lock. On the pilot's control yoke for pitch and roll control, we find the push to talk button for the radio, and on the rear side of the yoke, the intercom, and then a quick autopilot release switch, and then we find the yoke lock to, well, lock in place the yoke. Your control for the aircraft is naturally provided via the paddles. Also, can we just appreciate the old school Boeing logo here for a second? Like Boeing ain't sponsoring this episode, but that is nice and retro. Also, it was actually really nice filming this at Boeing Field near SeaTac, Washington State. It gave the whole shoot a very appropriate feel to it. The co-pilot stick has a very similar setup, however it does lack the autopilot push button. Now let's look closer to the turret that is installed just behind the pilot and co-pilot crew positions. The first thing we see here are the fuel tank selectors that are set behind the turret. And also here we see a high altitude suit heater unit. These would be dispersed around the crew positions to heat up the flight suits of the crew during high altitude sorties. The green box here gives you an indication where the ammunition storage would have been for the twin 50s. 
and then finally on the bottom we find the swivel point for the 360 rotation of the turret. Within the actual turret we have the turret control switches and then of course the belt fit 50 cal heavy machine guns, an oxygen regulator for the turret operator and then the bicycle handle shaped turret controller. To give you an idea of the all-around visibility, here is a 360 degree shot. Behind the turret we have the circuit breakers and the hydraulic reservoir. Then we come to the bomb bay. This is where the B-17 would carry its ordnance. Before we have a look at the bombs, let's swing around in the direction of the cockpit. On either side of the bridge you'll find the hand crank connectors for the emergency landing gear release and an emergency bomb bay door release is on the rear side of this catwalk. Now as I then leave the cockpit, I of course am confronted with the upper turret right here in its arrangement with 250s currently facing backwards towards the tail. And if I were then to cross over into the rear section of the B-17, I would have to cross the catwalk that you're currently standing on. So I come underneath the turret and I move inside of the bomb bay which currently also set up to hold dummy bombs right here or as you will see the fuses are not situated inside the bombs and then we just move through here towards the rear end of the fuselage then the bombs as said the b-17 could carry an assortment of lighter and heavier bombs due to the rounded fuselage shape these had to be installed in predefined positions and generally standardized bomb loads would be used depending on target and the required range the bombs itself would be installed in these handles that contained release hooks. These snap open when the bombardier releases the bombs at the interval that they were set to at the weapons console in the nose of the B-17. In Sentimental Journey, the bombs are mock-ups with period-appropriate seasonal greetings. Looking around, this gives you an idea of what it would have looked like back in the 1940s and, as I pass through the section, notice that it is not exactly built for my size. And then we could just go through this axis hatch towards the radio operator's position. We have the radio operator's main position to your left, my right, with his instrumentation. Uh, we have additional instrumentation that is mounted here or would be mounted here, including the short range radio that is in fact operated by the pilot. And now let's have a closer look at what you find here. And of course, let's not also forget the flex machine gun that is mounted in here that it sits on two rails on either side and it can be moved forward as this uh, this um, screen here is uh, retracted moved forward just to these points here and then the radio operator would move it from there shooting at incoming German fighters. In the radio operator's position we find the liaison receiver as well as the IFF crash switch and then on the opposite side, we have the command receivers installed on the where the command transmitters would have been. Additional transmitter and transmitter tuning units are mounted towards the rear end of this section with additional yellow colored oxygen bottles. All right, having finished the radio operator's position, let's move on to the real rear section of the B-17. And here we find immediately the Sperry Ball Turret in our way. And then we come to the Sperry Ball Turret, which is perhaps one of the most famous elements of the B-17. The AB Arizona team kindly opened up this position for us to get a better access for filming. I did not squeeze my body in there for the obvious reasons. On either side you will find the 50 cal machine guns. They are like right there. It is not going to be pleasant shooting them. The reflex side is mounted centrally on top and then you have two footrests. An aspect indicator is installed to give the gunner a quick reference to what direction the turret is actually pointing at. And the red charging handles on either side of the guns rack the guns and can also be used to clear a stoppage if needed. And then you have the oxygen flow and capacity indicators that are installed to the bottom right. To operate the turret a centrally mounted hand grip is used. As we then jump down here, we are confronted, of course, with these 250s. Now, these 250s are interesting. First of all, of course, they're offset so that the two gunners do not get in each other's way. But they also have the original ammo boxes right here stored with a complete number of 600 rounds. 
What is also interesting with the configuration that you see here is that the sight on the guns is in fact the 1945 sight, which is somewhat improved over sort of this, this iron spider web sort of sight that initially the gunners would have. And uh, they, of course, also have all the equipment that is required for them to operate. They have the intercom system where they can communicate with each other, call out targets. Uh, they have their oxygen supply as well. All crew members would also be care able to carry out around small green uh, oxygen bottles as they move throughout the B-17 in, in case there's something that uh, needs to be done on a different section of the aircraft. And then as that is done, let's move further towards the back, towards the tail here. And of course, just one little reminder here, of course, sentimental journey, this B-17 that you're seeing right here is offering living history flight experiences where you can, in fact, be on a B-17 in flight. And some of the positions that you here, see here, some of the seats here are the ones that you could experience that flight on. So that's really, really cool. Definitely check out the description below as well to see more on that. Now let's turn around then and look at the tail. The tail gunner position is currently blocked off. I believe Airbase Arizona uses this to ferry their own equipment for their tours around the country, which means that I will be spared the squeezing and contortion of trying to get in there. The tail turret was described in the previous part of the video, and it is a redesigned turret with a wider field of fire from the previous B-17 models. It still houses two 50 cal machine guns, and they are belt fed with ammo coming in from either side along the fuselage. It is popularly considered the most dangerous position on the B-17, although an Army Air Force evaluation during World War II came to somewhat different results. You can also check out my video for that here. I want to extend a big thank you here to the crew of Sentimental Journey at the commemorative Air Force Air Base Arizona. They often tour the country and if you want to learn more, see the description. Also a big shout out here to all the community supporters and crowdfunders who made this trip possible. Without you, Inside the Cockpit would not exist. Hope you enjoyed the early access to this episode and for everyone, I hope you have a great day and see you in the sky. Uh, 